All right. So uh, thanks for the wait and patience, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, and I know we do have a bunch of groups that fit that bill today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And today is particularly exciting. It is day four of our epic deep dive into climate change. We, by the end of the week, will have done 22 programs from around the globe. We've been joined in the remote Pacific Islands. We've gone up to Svalbard from the Ladies of Hearts in the Ice. We've talked about snow in the Arctic and landing on remote ice sheets in the uh, near the North Pole. It's been a really, really exciting festival. And so thank you so much to all our teachers for joining us live and on YouTube as we continue to celebrate such amazing people and places around the globe. Today for our program, we are joined by one of my favorite speakers we ever have on the broadcast. I've hosted a thousand broadcasts, easily top 10 speaker of all time, Dr. Kim Kopp. Her work has taken her around the globe from caving in Borneo to remote Pacific islands. She's going to talk to us today a little bit about her amazing work around the globe. And I always like to highlight her awesome Twitter uh, mention of a sort of a breakdown of her career, that she is 40% climate scientist, 40% mom, and 20% Indiana Jones. I think her Indiana Jones quotient might be a bit higher. I'll leave you guys to determine that with me in just a minute. But without further ado, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Cobb, and take us away. Great. Well, thanks so much. Uh, it's a super honor and a great excitement to be here with you guys today um, during your exploration of so much amazing content around climate science and to understand the work of what goes into understanding how our planet is changing, how it affects uh, people and what we can do about it. Today, we're going to be talking about all of those things. And we're going to start with the lens of my favorite aspect of our climate system, the oceans. And so uh, without further ado, uh, let's get started. And I just wanted to make a note about the um, the Twitter bio that Jesse mentioned, because, uh, you know, these days I'm feeling much more than 40 percent mom where I have four kids uh, homeschooling in their 13 month of remote schooling here. So shout out to all the students in the world and their amazing teachers who are getting through this. So uh, here we are together to be in community and to share some lovely pictures and insights uh, from the world of science uh, far across our planet in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So today, really, we're gonna talk about corals. And corals are an amazing organism. Uh, you certainly have seen their beauty on a reef like the photo that I'm showing here before, uh, but you also may not have known that they are some of our best available climate records peering into the past about how ocean temperatures have evolved and what that means for our future. You may also know that corals are one of the victims of climate change as well, um, being some of the most fragile and vulnerable ecosystems on our planet to rising ocean temperatures and other impacts of our climate that's underway and changing already. So without further ado, let me click forward here and just start with the basic question. Uh, what is a coral? A coral is an amazing organism. It's been around for 260 million years. Let me pause and just go back to that number. 260 million years corals have been living on our planet and thriving because of the success of their formula. What is a coral then? What makes it so successful? A coral is an animal, of course, as you probably know from some of your uh, uh, biology work that you've done in school, but it's actually quite empowered by some very tiny algae that are photosynthesizing inside the coral tissue. And those coral uh, algal symbionts, that's a symbiosis relationship. They both get something out of it. Those coral symbionts are providing food to the coral as well. Those coral symbionts also give it its amazing color. All the different colors of the rainbow can be seen on a healthy reef like the ones that I'm showing here today. Of course, a coral reef provides very important habitat for so many different species of marine organisms. We see fish here floating in the water, but there's also many, many organisms that are uh, down to the microscopic organisms in size, those microbes that thrive and grow and depend on the coral reef for any aspects of their life cycle. So that's what, in its uh, nutshell, what a coral is. And of course, uh, when you go to think about what my work involves, my work involves the hard parts of coral, the homes that they build themselves out of seawater in this incredible process of biomineralization that they do. And so here's a cross section of a coral and you can see that it has these tentacles floating in the water and those tentacles can grab onto food and 
shove it down into the mouth. And you can see the portion below the coral uh, hanging out with the soft parts, if you will, that it builds these hard parts, this home for itself uh, down below in those tissue layers. And it's accreting the coral skeleton through time in this huge growing uh, blob of skeleton. And it, these corals can get up to many stories high, like four stories high um, on the powerful reefs like the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. So if we think about how we use these corals to look back in time, then we're going to use those skeletons to peer, peer back at past ocean temperatures. So this is a picture of me doing my best impersonation of Indiana Jones, smack down the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And here you can see I'm wielding a very large and heavy and very powerful hydraulic drill, which is my favorite things. And uh, we're extracting this coral core, which is about three inches in diameter. You can see it coming out there. And each one of these coral cores will contain a really precious time capsule of about 10 years of information into past ocean temperatures that we're going to take back to our labs at Georgia Tech and analyze on some chemical instrumentation that we have there to look at the layers and how they differ from a chemical composition. And that chemical composition is related to changes in ocean temperature. So these corals are growing pretty fast. They're growing about one finger width per year and so over those time periods they can get up to many hundreds of years long providing us a window into past ocean temperatures way before anybody ever stuck a thermometer in the ocean in these places so where do i do my work i do my work in the middle of the pacific ocean and you may or may not know that this view of the earth is uh, something very very special because it's the pacific ocean in its entirety it covers about 50 percent of our planet's surface <laughs> that's why of course we call ourselves the blue planet uh, and this is in my lab in the middle of the pacific ocean uh, this we're going to talk a lot about a uh, christmas island today which is my primary research site almost smack dab in the geographic middle of the ocean and this is some of the pictures from the research sites that I have the privilege and honor of working at for over 20 years now in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. You can see photos of Christmas Island down on the lower right. You can see Fanning Island, which is an amazing uh, coral atoll uh, located very close by. Um, its uh, name in Gilbertese is Tabuedan, which means sacred footprint. I think we can all see why. And then Palmyra Island, uh, the first my first love, the first site I ever worked at during my graduate studies, obviously uh, sweeping views of these pristine tropics landscapes above ground and below water, we see these amazingly rich pristine coral reefs that have dominated these landscapes for thousands of years. So what happens to corals, we talked about this briefly and I'm gonna dig into it a little bit more. Corals actually get very unhappy when ocean temperatures rise too much. And this is due to their physiology and in large part owing to the unhappiness of their uh, algal photosynthetic symbionts that live inside their tissues when it gets too hot. And so what happens when it gets too hot is these algal photosymbionts leave the tissue and this takes all the color out of the tissue and so they bleach and then they need to wait for ocean temperatures to come back down and then the algal photosymbionts come back in and they have their precious food factories back and they're back in business. What happens if it doesn't get cool enough very quickly within a matter of a few months, the coral tissue will die, literally starving to death, missing those precious food resources from the algal photosymbionts that it normally relies on. And so this is a picture of a partially bleached coral that you can see the transparent tissues wafting in the water. And here you can still see some remnants of those colorful green uh, symbionts inside the tissues that are taking sunlight and converting it into food inside those tissues here. And so what's happening with ocean temperatures is happening all over the world. Uh, it's warming up and it's starting to warm up quite quickly. And in particular, 2016 was the warmest year on record, but of the last five years, they've all been the five warmest years on record. 2020 just closed and we can say as climate scientists, it was came within a hair of beating out 2016 as the warmest year ever on record. And this graph is a lovely visualization of the global temperatures through time 
starting from about 1880 on the far left and moving through and you can see ups and downs and moving into light pinks, then reds, and then the super dark reds in the very recent past indicating that the pace of this warming is accelerating and it's pushing society and ecosystems into new levels of threat that we have never experienced before as a species. And so this is one of the things that's coming home to roost in coral reefs all over the world. And I'm showing you some pictures from Christmas Island over the last major El Nino event, which is a natural climate phenomenon which raises ocean temperatures across the equatorial Pacific uh, about you know six up to six degrees Fahrenheit relative to uh, before these events. And this was a prolonged 10 month period of very elevated temperatures from about 20, late 2014 um, through early 2016. We saw this water temperatures rise and then they came back down again. So in 2014, before this event, we saw an amazingly healthy, diverse reef. Look at all the different types of corals. They're beautiful colors, um, providing habitat and food and function for so many organisms in these environments. Fast forward to 2016, after 10 months of very elevated ocean temperatures, we see that this reef has been decimated by those coral bleaching. First, in early in the warming, and then later in the warming, the mortality and death of up to 85% of the coral reef. And these are from the same sites. So this is apples and apples here, um, looking at those coral deaths. Now what's happening on the Great Barrier Reef is also hitting the headlines lately. Uh, we have elevated ocean temperatures almost every year now from the uh, from the Great Barrier Reef. On the left-hand side, I'm showing you this picture of a very recent bleaching episode from the Great Barrier Reef. And on the right here, I'm showing work by uh, Professor Terry Hughes in Australia, who's documented with his teams and painstaking efforts to document the, the extent of bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef um, over this 2020 warming event that occurred there. And you can see all the reds are indicating severe coral bleaching. And unfortunately, this has become an almost annual occurrence on one of the most magnificent uh, structures on our planet's surface, uh, the Great Barrier Reef, the one of the only living organisms that's visible from space. So what do we do about this? Because this is marching down pretty quickly now, but it's easy to feel overwhelmed and just oh, completely depressed about the state of, of the situation, especially when we think about what corals have been through in recent years. And we know that going forward, it's going to get a little bit worse before it gets better. But it's not too late to fix this problem. And science tells us that. And I am a climate scientist here to tell you today that it's not too late to fix this. We can reverse climate change in your lifetime. And I'm going to do everything I can to get there as well. So how can you help this problem? And kids have so much to do to help us be accelerating this conversation. And so these are some tangible things that kids can do to help us with climate change and start turning the turning this tanker around. So the number one thing you can do is think about how you can conserve gas and electricity. By the way, you'll be saving money when you do that. <laughs> of course, thinking about energy efficiency. And energy efficiency, of course, occurs in our homes by the light bulbs that we choose. We can choose light bulbs that burn 10 times less energy, like the ones that I have at my house. Or you can still, unfortunately, buy the very inefficient ones at the Home Depot as well. And then thinking about uh, exercising your right to walk and bike to school when you can. You'll be getting some good exercise along the way, as you do. And this is something I've enjoyed doing with my kids over the last couple of years after 10 years of driving everybody around. So this is something that your school can embrace as well. The second big thing that we don't actually realize occurs in terms of a climate change driver is the food waste that we have. Did you know that Americans on average throw away up to 40% of the food that we are uh, buying from these stores and serving up in restaurants and growing in our farms? So 40% is a very big number and a lot of energy goes into making that food and then we throw it into the trash can where it actually generates more problems with greenhouse gas generation as well. So one of the number one solutions that science tells us to help with climate change is trying to drive down that number within our households and with our own choices. The number three thing here is to recognize the outsized impacts of red meat with climate change. Red meat has almost 10 times 
times the greenhouse gas driver baked into it than any other protein choice you could make like chicken or pork or of course tofu which is even better um, in my house we have a flexitarian situation going on because we have so many different people but we have cut out red meat out of our diets in an effort to be part of that solution because we just can't keep doing that much damage to our planet through the raising of cattle and the fourth thing of course is plant some trees, which are our natural climate solution. We can grow shade within our urban environments and protect people from extreme heat. We can help with water management during the floods that we know may come with uh, increased climate change, of course, and we can get out there in the fresh air and be part of the solution, allowing those trees to sequester carbon dioxide, a heat trapping gas, into their trunks, into their branches um, for the next several decades while we turn this tanker of climate change around. Let's put trees to work for us. And so this is just a picture of me and my kids uh, planting, I don't know how many trees we planted with Trees Atlanta, many hundreds probably. I think this might be uh, vitamin tree. You know, my kids always like naming the trees, of course. So one tree is worth about a thousand pounds of carbon dioxide. And last but not least, and the most important message today is to show the world you care by your by talking about it with people who you have around you, your teachers, your friends, your family, and whenever you have the opportunity, the whole world. So this is my family and I taking part in a, a Fridays for Future, the big global climate strike that we had in September 2019, I think this was. Um, and this is a great way to tell the world you care along with millions of other people around the world. And I want to stress the importance of young people lifting their voice in this moment. The whole reason why we have action on this subject across the world is because young heroes and activists all over the world have raised their voices and said, not with my future, not with my future, you do not. And so we have got to get to work to help make sure that we can turn this around as soon as possible. We don't have a moment to waste. So with that, I'll click out of my slides today and hope that we can take some questions in discussion. That was fantastic as always. You were so fast, you packed so much in that we're actually like right on time, even with the delay, so just like rock star, as I said. And I love that you mentioned this. Now, one of the things we've been highlighting all week long in this Climate Fest is that I think a lot of people assumed my generation was gonna be the one that was really gonna take the lead and really you know, push for activism for solving climate issues. And it's not, it's the kids in these classrooms today. I mean, you yeah. guys have seen this with Greta and doing you know million kid marches around the world. This is a really exciting time to be raising your voice to maybe making a real positive difference. And I think that that's a really fantastic message. So thank you, Dr. Cobb. Um, let's dive in with questions. We've got at least six other full classrooms joining us on YouTube, which is awesome from Illinois, across Ontario and beyond. Uh, we're gonna dive in with our live classes first. And Dr. Cobb, I don't know if you can see us right now, but if you wanna exit screen share entirely, by all means do that if it helps out a little bit. Um, let's head first to Mr. Lavogue's class. They're joining us in North Palm Beach, Florida, one of our most engaged classes all week long. Mr. Lavogue, come on in, take us away. Good morning, good morning, Dr. Cobb. Thank you. Um, we, uh, question for you. We, we focus a lot at our school. We're a K-8 school, um, and we focus a lot about representation and, 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 why, and why that's important. And a second grader, one of my second graders uh, emailed me wanting to know, was it difficult or is it difficult still being a woman in science and was it hard to break into it? And uh, can you describe that process and why why it's important to have women in, in, in sciences? Well, yeah, thanks for that question. It's something I'm very, very passionate about. I do a lot of work in trying to make sure that the, um, the as women move through sciences, and it, it's important to note, it's not just women, um, you know, people of, of racial and ethnic minorities, uh, members of the LGBTQ community, there are many different pockets of adversity that, that start to accumulate through time as you move through uh, a field like science or for that matter, uh, academia in general. And so I wanna make that uh, very clear at the beginning in, in my work across uh, advancing diversity in, in science and engineering and math it is really aimed at, at all of those groups because uh, we all rise when we fight to have diverse voices, when we fight to have representation. So as a woman in science, um, I found many, many doors open to me. 
And I know that uh, you will too, if you are uh, young women thinking about scientific careers, if you are um, uh, black and indigenous uh, person of color, you will find many doors uh, opening to you along the way. You will also start to realize that there are very unique hurdles that stand in your way and that you're going to need additional help to get over those. And so one of the things I found so important in my own career is building a strong network of colleagues that I can turn to um, and, and relate with shared experiences, um, lift each other up and help each other over those hurdles and to make sure that uh, we rise together and that we turn around to those that are following us and we gain energy from bringing those people with us along the way. And so this has become a life mission of mine. And, and the more children I had, the more I realized uh, how uh, difficult it can be to balance the uh, needs of a growing career in which I am passionately devoted to, as well as, of course, uh, you know, requiring a, a huge amount of energy to ensure that I'm, I'm raising my children not to be sociopaths, which is, I realize, a low bar, but, you know, sometimes that's how I feel. Uh, and so that is something that we need to begin to tackle as well in science, not just uh, making sure that uh, women can be in science, but that uh, people can have and bring their full lives to the table when they are a scientist. They don't check these identities at the door, that they are allowed to nourish and, and that they can thrive within the identity that they have uh, as, as a person, whether it be a mother or a, a, a gardener or an activist. Uh, there has to be representation, there has to be room for all of these things. So uh, many, many doors will be open to you. Please take them uh, because it is the most fulfilling job in the world to be a scientist that's working at this interface of such importance to humanity right now. So we need all hands on deck and I'm sure that many of the listeners today will be those important voices and those discoverers that will help us uh, turn the situation around this century. That was an incredibly beautiful and thoughtful answer, as I uh, expected. I, thought, I was wondering if you were going to get that question throughout the broadcast. I'm so glad you kicked us off with it, Mr. Lavogue. I want to note, too, just a few quick resources for some of our teachers. 500 Women Scientists, which has many more than 500 women scientists. If you're keen to bring in someone for an event, obviously exploring by the seat of your pants, we do about 65% of our events with women. We spend the entire month of February only showcasing amazing women from across the globe, but that is a really fantastic resource to learn more. And in Canada, just recently announced, uh, there's some amazing colleagues of ours and friends of ours, uh, Kaleidoscope Nature, highlighting black uh, scientists and explorers out in nature. We're doing a program with one of their members just next week with Dr. Emily Choi, so I'd encourage you to check that out as well. And I mean, you Oh, what, yeah, what, one more thing I wanted to add in terms of resources is the amazing uh, groundswell of um, hashtag black and marine science, black in neuroscience, black in as, astronomy. Um, yeah. If you want to uh, expose your students to diverse spaces and careers and this an amazing community that has come up uh, in, in 2020, for very good reason with long overdue as well. Um, this is a great way to showcase those folks who are out doing the work to um, you know, build themselves up, lift each other up in this work. So I'm, I'm amazed, I of course am most closely filled with black and marine science and all of those people are just yeah. amazing scientists and scholars. Yep. We um, we recently had Carly Jackson. She's in uh, Founded Minorities in Shark Science. She's amazing. I was going to highlight your Twitter feed later, but check out Kim's work at Corals and Caves on Twitter. Uh, she's amazing, not just in terms of highlighting her own work, but that of amplifying uh, those colleagues around the globe. So I really, really encourage you to check that out. And I mean, as you heard in, in Dr. Kyle's beginning, she talked about being a mom, being a mom to four kids, especially in a time when there's a lot of at-home learning going on, which makes it a lot more hectic. Um, so thanks for your time today. Um, I want to note too, for any of our students, and a lot of our kids might already know know this Emily's Wonder Lab so Emily Calandrelli did hosted a major science program while like eight months pregnant which has never been done ever so check out that amazing program on Netflix it's really really cool to keep that the excitement going all right we'll keep diving in with questions if anyone does have any more questions about these these topics or resources please just email us and I will get you all the cool names and people and, and topics to, to keep learning going let's head to Miss King's class they're joining us in at Glen Pennsylvania come on up guys hi <laughs> Okay, so how, so we're learning about endangered species. Have you ever seen endangered species in um, the water? 
Yeah, I mean, there are lots of endangered species in our oceans, unfortunately. Um, one of the most common questions I get is, you know, have you ever seen a shark underwater? And, you know, sharks, certain sharks are endangered. Um, the sharks that I see on the reefs at, at Christmas Island are not endangered, but I want to just stop and highlight the importance of uh, marine conservation efforts and uh, what we need to do to make sure that populations like sharks remain healthy in our world's ocean because they play an incredibly important role, as does every organism in the ocean in, in a system that has evolved over you know, tens, tens of millions of years uh, to, to be a critical part of our planet's uh, health system. And so uh, with sharks, it's uh, unfortunately the state that these populations are in dramatic decline uh, from overfishing, in many cases, illegal fishing of shark populations across the world. So when I used to jump in the water and when my career started 20 years ago, um, I used to see sharks almost every dive. <laughs> and of course, it you know, makes your heart skip a little beat when, when you see them. Um, but obviously, uh, the number of shark attacks is smaller than the number of people that get struck by lightning every year. So this is not a concern for me, even though, uh, you know, I'm not like, super happy to be swimming with a bunch of sharks initially, but I, I came to regard them as a sign of a, a healthy ecosystem and a necessary component of the ecosystem. And unfortunately today when I get in the water, I don't see a single shark and I haven't seen a shingle shark in over five years of diving at Christmas Island lately. So it's just, I hope brings into our consciousness something that is out of sight out of mind on a daily basis, uh, the plight of especially shark species around the world, but including uh, whaling, which is allowed under certain, um, you know, <laughs> house of cards like uh, shell games that go on with international regulations that are routinely broken by certain countries. We, we have to get our act together and rise the challenge of the time to protect these critical marine organisms uh, before they are risk are at risk of extinction. So this is a an early call to action um, in a situation which is going nowhere fast. And I, I believe that we might yet find a way to protect these iconic species that play such an important role in the ocean's health and therefore they play an important role in our health, but there's not a day to lose. Yeah. That's a, again, a great answer. Thank you so much to Ms. King students. And I'm so glad you focused on sharks and that you could have chosen so many different animals, but highlighting sharks I think is so important. And we like to do that here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. So I really appreciate that. Um, we're going to head to Mr. Jeffrey's class in Earlton, Ontario in just a second, and I want to note I'm coming to YouTube for a few more questions in just a minute. So, Mr. Jeffrey, just unmute that microphone and uh, come on in. Hi. Uh, uh, we have a question from Eric uh, asking, what is it like to work underwater or water and to uh, is there any special difficulties or things that you enjoy uh, during working? <laughs> so working underwater is pretty demanding, <laughs> especially because working ab above water with the kind of equipment that we're working with uh, is very demanding. So it's even worse underwater. And, you know, I think one of the things that, um, you know, people don't realize is, is how taxing it is to do research underwater. And uh, for all the dives that I've been on, and I've been on many kind of pleasure dives, I uh, have to do that to keep up my certification. Uh, you know, that that's great. Like, I love being underwater. I probably could just live underwater. Uh, that's how comfortable I feel with that environment. It's, it's my second home, my preferred home, if you will. But when I'm, when I'm working underwater, uh, it's a very different story. And scuba diving, of course, brings its own hazards. And when you're working underwater, those hazards are greatly magnified because your, your attention is not focused on your uh, depth gauge. Your attention is not focused on your air gauge. Your attention is not focused necessarily on your own um, balance in the water column, all things that could potentially kill you. And so what we have to do when we are um, green lighted to work and do research underwater is go through a, an extensive research training program, which helps us go through any number of different demanding tasks underwater while paying attention to those critical safety elements. And you have to remember that it's not just me who's underwater doing research. It's a whole team of people that are underwater doing research at the same time. And my brain has to be dedicated to thinking about the team safety underwater as well. So we focus a lot on, on dive planning, um, uh, practicing our drills of emergency, uh, rescuing each other, uh, buddy systems. Uh, we will go in with a, a rock solid plan. And if there's anything that is remotely hazardous about that dive environment, 
we will call off our dive for the day. Remember that Christmas Island is remote enough that in order for you to get to uh, really critical emergency care in the event of a dive accident, you have to call Hawaii. The Coast Guard has to send an airplane for you. That's five hours one way. You get on the airplane and then you get five hours back. <laughs> so that is not a good prospect. So we take dive safety very seriously at Christmas Island. And that's my number one concern when I'm working underwater. Thanks for that great question. Yeah, I love that. One of the things that we hear from divers a lot is that they do go in with a little bit of, of fear, you know, respect for what they're doing. This is a dangerous environment. It's very exciting, but it's it's really worth prepping, just like you would for an Arctic expedition or for, you know, going up to space. I do want to highlight the positive aspect, though, and I mean, I certainly think that you, you did that in a brilliant way. For our kids today, if you are keen to explore 71% of this planet underwater, Patty Bubble Maker. So at eight years old, you can start on the path to being a scuba diver like Dr. Cobb. I just got my certification last year. It's one of the best things I've ever done in my life. Go ahead and do that. I know it's kind of odd with the pandemic, but as soon as we can, get out there and, and you know take that leap. It's a really exciting opportunity. All right, let's take a few YouTube questions. We've got some rapid fire coral questions for you from a whole bevy of teachers. So let's see if we can do this. We've got Miss Lee's class. Never seen this question before, but two kids in Miss Lee's class wanted to know, do corals poo? What's going on? <laughs> Uh, no, corals don't don't really poo. So you know they have a, uh, a an optional intake system of food uh, from the top that they can actually take in solid materials. And they some corals uh, do a better job at uh, grazing uh, than others. And other corals are more reliant on those uh, precious food factories that they have in their tissues. Uh, that we all have waste products. <laughs> all animals have some kind of waste products, uh, but it doesn't really, you know, look like poo in, in any traditional sense, because I guess you're already, you know, in, encased in water as it were. And so the waste products are, are just kind of expelled uh, through tissues that are in constant contact with the water at any rate. So that's a, a kind of a good way to think about it, but that's a great I question. I've never seen the question before. I was actually genuinely curious about that. So that's very neat, guys. Um, let's see. Miss Fusco's class wants to know how many kinds of corals are there? Oh my goodness. Um, you know, we are still discovering new coral species. And, you know, that's how diverse corals are. Um, and, you know, I, I find this absolutely amazing to think that I could be at any moment that I'm diving at Christmas Island, I'd be coming, you know, in contact with corals that we haven't discovered before, uh, that have not been characterized before. So there are thousands of different types of corals. And it's really interesting because across the various tropical oceans, the Atlantic, the Indian, and the Pacific Ocean, um, we see very different kinds of reefs. Not every reef looks the same. They have very different species in the Atlantic Ocean than they do in the Pacific Ocean, and very different kinds of species in the Western Pacific than the Eastern Pacific. So it is just amazing to go around the world and to dye these different reef environments and to see the diversity of assemblages and colors and shapes that, that you see and to know that these reef systems have grown up to be that way based on their environmental conditions to thrive. And that is why those corals are there. So it's um, it's a, a wild ride to dive in places like the Red Sea, New Caledonia, Hawaii, uh, and my sites in the Central Pacific, and to uh, keep in mind just the mind blowing diversity that exists on these reefs. Yeah. I love that. I love that you highlighted that there's more being found every day. We, we bring on Diva Amon. She's an amazing deep sea biologist. And there's certain habitats in the world, like coral reefs, like the deep sea, like jungles, where when you go, you always are finding new things. And I think that's really exciting for kids to hear that you can go out and discover things that no one has ever cataloged before. Yeah. No one's ever described this to science. And that's an amazing, uh, that's, that's as magical to me now as it was when I was four years old. And I first heard about that as a kid. So very, very cool. Um, one more quick YouTube question. Then we'll come back with a live round with all our class. This is Miss Dykstra's class, our first one here, who was here 20 minutes before we even got underway. She was so excited. They want to know, what are some examples of creatures that are becoming endangered because of the loss of coral habitats? So, you know, the, the loss of coral habitats has been going on for several decades, actually. And, you know, some of the earlier losses that we've had globally have occurred in the Caribbean. And so there's a, a lot of information from uh, you know the early 70s when we were looking at photos of the Caribbean and you know there were actual reefs in places that today don't exist. And so uh, that degradation of coral reef environment um, really had to do with the uh, fishing practices, with the development practices in the Caribbean, not necessarily related to climate change. Uh, climate change has taken over as kind of the global scale threat 
uh, to coral reefs. But some of the information we have from the Caribbean that where you know the the loss of reefs has been longer in place because you have to remember that you know we're just taking some of these early hits in so many different places like Christmas Island. Um, you know, took this really profound hit in 2016, and so the system there is just kind of reeling through the near term effects, right? And it is under recovery. Very important to note that the reefs, Great Barrier Reef and Christmas Island reefs are under recovery. And we hope that they are able to recover as much as possible to their former state. But reefs like the Caribbean have been in decline for decades. And so what we can see there is that, you know, we're talking about um, turtles, right? Or, or many other kinds of larger organisms uh, that depend on the ecosystem that builds up from the reef. So it's not just the loss of the reef, it's the loss of the entire uh, food webs that come up and depend uh, on the reef for their existence. And so unfortunately, there are many documented species uh, across the Caribbean that have either gone extinct or are under massive extinction pressures, uh, in part due to the loss of coral reefs, which has this trickle on effect. And so again, um, thinking about this as a systems problem, not just a coral reef problem, is one of the key takeaways from hopefully my talking points today. Fantastic. I'm so, again, we've been getting so many great questions today, which is just awesome. Uh, I, I always love these presentations so much. Uh, let's dive back in with our live groups. We've got about five, six minutes left, tons of time. So let's go to Mr. Laveau's class to start. Uh, unmute that mic, come on back in, and we'll head back to lovely Florida. We, um, our school's about a mile away from the Atlantic Ocean, and our kids spend a lot of time in and around the ocean and underwater. And so you're, I've got a lot of questions related to right at the beginning of your presentation when you did the drilling. Uh, for the sample of the coral, um, you know, we're always told not to touch it or not to get near yeah. it. And how, do, how does that, does that hurt the coral or wh what are the effects? That's a great question. It's one of my most common questions I get, right? I, I should always be careful to mention it in my talk because it is important. Uh, yeah, you should never be touching corals. They are very, very delicate organisms and the, the colony depends on the integrity of the entire colony. And so a, a small isolated point of damage can actually grow to weaken the entire colony. So that's why you're not supposed to touch corals aside from the fact that they can actually hurt you quite a bit if you do touch them. Um, so what we do with our drilling and you can see me try to stay as far away from that coral I was drilling as possible. Um, and of course, when we drill that core, the coral material at the top of the core is dead because I'm going to be pulling out of water and taking it back to Georgia Tech. And we um, are careful to plug the hole that we created with a uh, plug of marine cement. And we kind of hammer that in really well. And over time, a, a otherwise healthy coral colony will slowly grow over that hole in successive years, actually pretty quickly, right? Because they're growing about a centimeter or two centimeters per year and, and grow over that hole and keep going like nothing ever happened. And so that's uh, what we've seen over the couple decades of uh, drilling on reefs. And of course, we're not drilling, you know, 50 cores per expedition. We're, we're drilling like three to five cores. And so we're able to see those coral colonies recover. The sad part of that story is that the, the precious corals that we uh, plugged back and documented their recovery, um, all of those corals were taken out and killed during the 2016 temperature extreme. So again, uh, bringing into sharp relief that we need to do all we can to help preserve uh, coral reefs today. But we also need to think about how we can uh, really rise to address the challenge of climate change, which uh, no matter what we do, will be coming for many of our planet's precious reefs in the near future. So that's really one of the take homes today. I'm really, really glad we got that question. On one of my own uh, diving experiences in my life, it was interesting to see that the dive team was actually grabbing corals and moving along them. And that's not a, a practice that you want to be promoting. And it's something that a lot of people can actually take action on. Certainly, you can not do it yourself. You can call it out when you see it. And that really does make a positive difference. So great question, Mr. Lavo. All right, Miss King's class, back to Pennsylvania. Come on, on in, and then we'll head to Ontario to Mr. Jeffrey to wrap up. Hi, <laughs> have, you, have you ever seen any weird sea creatures in the ocean? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I'm actually going to talk about a, a weird sea creature that I didn't see, <laughs> which is my most unpleasant experience diving ever. And so, um, you know, you may not realize this, but there are, of course, uh, you're swimming in sea creatures every time you jump in the ocean. You oftentimes just can't see them because they're quite small. And in many cases, some of these are uh, gelatinous and see-through kinds of things. And for whatever reason, on one of my dives, and I think it was 2013, um, I got out of the water and everything seemed, seemed totally fine. But within hours, I was 
puffed up, <laughs> you know, to about three times state. And all my skin was just red rashes everywhere. And we couldn't figure out what it was. And eventually um, we put it together that um, I had a, a small um, kind of mark on my hand that I'd obviously been stung by something. <laughs> and I, I didn't even see, nobody else saw anything in the water either during that dive. And so uh, we realized that there are, of course, at any given moment, lots of different organisms in the ocean floating around that are very small. Some of them have sting cells. Obviously I had pretty allergic reaction to one of those. So that remains my story of the mystery organism uh, that I, I tangled with <laughs> on that one dive that I'll never forget. A good reminder that uh, obviously when we're diving in uh, for research, um, the, the more we can cover ourselves up, the less we are susceptible to that. This was just a, a hand that I kept bare to do some fine detail work. And uh, I think since then I've chosen to wear my gloves, which was probably a wise choice. <laughs> My one, my first ever checkout dive, I reached out and cut my finger wide open on a bunch of uh, zebra mussels in Lake Ontario. Ooh. So this is like the patty bubble maker group that are going to go and learn diving after this. Make sure to wear all the gear. It's, it's an important thing. Yeah, it's good uh, for protection as well as warmth, of course. Absolutely. Um, Mr. Jeffrey, wrap us up. This has been so, so much fun. I know we have more questions that we can possibly answer, but I'd love to end off the broadcast with you today. So come on in. Well, uh, we have a question from Allegra, and she is wondering, uh, she noticed that there were a lot of photos taken. She's wondering uh, what, how to take those photos and also what you do with the data that you receive from your uh, various expeditions. Yeah, so um, when I first started, you know, taking underwater photos was, you know, a whole ordeal and they never turned out very well. Um, nowadays, there are uh, any number of kind of lower cost uh, cameras that you know even poor researchers like me can can get and uh, use to great effect. And so uh, it has become a lot easier to take much higher quality uh, video footage uh, underwater with GoPros, which is what our go-to is, as well as with um, you know a, a camera that is you know the size. Uh, of, a, of a mouse or so uh, that has a powerful enough flash to, to do a pretty good photo at close range. And so we use a, a lot of those techniques. Sometimes we have the benefit of full uh, photography crews and, and documentary crews that are along with us. And we get these kind of more iconic images that look like they should be in National Geographic. Um, most of our photos that we take are for research purposes. And so the second question was really about what do we do with all the data that we get? And so every piece of data that we have generated over the 20 years of work um, is public publicly available at the NOAA Climate Data Repository. And so um, that's important because all of this work is pretty much taxpayer funded. So uh, the National Science Foundation has funded my team for about 20 years now. And so that data is, is your data. It's everybody's data and it belongs in open access so that anybody can use it to study these precious systems and not have to go uh, out and drill their own corals and get their own uh, measurements. And so um, that's something that we believe in very, very strongly. And uh, I'm proud to say that we have 100 uh, percent public data repository out there at NOAA. Uh, along with many other of my colleagues who have logged their data for public access as well. So that's really important to, to note in terms of um, our responsibilities as taxpayer funded researchers. You've hit upon basically every major important issue in all of the sciences in one broadcast, which is really hard to pull off. So thank you for that. And uh, uh, great questions from everyone today. This has been so, so much fun. Um, Dr. Cobb, before we wrap up, I just want to make sure that we can highlight a few resources for kids to keep the learning going. So you mentioned Fridays for Future, an amazing program. encourage all our kids to check it out. Uh, in Canada, one of our big partners for this festival has been Environment and Climate Change Canada. They've got an awesome climatekids.ca resource, all sorts of neat learning activities for parents and kids. Uh, check out Dr. Cobb at Corals and Caves. And then, of course, if you're keen to learn more about this entire festival, you can either check out all the programs on our YouTube channel or check us out on our website, exploringbythesea.com. Dr. Cobb, this is so much fun. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. I, I really, really appreciate it. Oh, the pleasure was all mine, Jesse. Thanks so much. And thanks to all of you for your time and attention today. Well, let's bring them in to say a quick goodbye and thank you so much to Mr. Lavogue, Miss King's class, and Mr. Jeffrey. If you could join me in saying a quick farewell, Dr. Cobb. 